Welcome to the Angie Spoke Podcast. Today we have Bonnie Koo on the show. She is a board certified dermatologist, wealth coach, and the founder of Wealthy Mom MD. She coaches female physicians on how to manage and grow their money. We both recently completed our advanced certification in feminist coaching. And as soon as I learned that she coaches women on money and is about to release a brand new book on this topic, I knew that we had to have her on the show. Her mission is to help successful women create wealth and rewrite history, which I love. And of course, as you all know, that aligns with ours beautifully. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. Please meet Bonnie Koo. Hi, Bonnie. Welcome to the Angie Spoke Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, Bonnie. So i um, really, really excited to talk to you. You are a money coach. You work with um, female physicians. Let's just start with having you introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. So I am a physician. I'm a dermatologist by training. And so diagnosing skin diseases, although I stopped seeing patients about a year ago. And I live in New Jersey, just outside of New York City. I am not married, but I do have a fiance. We're basically married though. And I have a toddler who's three and a half. And so you are a full-time coach. Is that right? Yep. You got it. And you coach who? I coach female physicians. All right. And so first, I mean, we've, we're going to totally dive into women and money, but I really want to know what that was like to leave medicine, to be a full-time coach. Well, it wasn't on purpose. And even like this whole business idea wasn't like planned. And so it kind of all seemed like an accident, but of course, looking back now, I can just, you know, just in the coaching philosophy, it was always meant to be this way. Right. But the leaving medicine part was partially pandemic related. And so I was working on my coaching business and it was making money. And then the pandemic happened and I had actually changed the way I practiced from like a regular full-time job to working these short-term assignments, we call them locums in medicine. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing these like short-term, like three-month assignments in Seattle. And I did a three-month assignment in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And the job in Hawaii ended the end of February, 2020. So we all know what happened in March of 2020. And so my plan was before the pandemic, my plan was to come back to the New York City area and look for a, you know, part-time position And so basically I was going to stop working full-time as a physician, but I was going to still work part-time and work on my business. So I was actually interviewing for jobs and then obviously the pandemic happened and everything kind of shut down. And so I was like, okay, I'll just keep working on my coaching business. I was doing a little bit of teledermatology and that was pre-planned before the pandemic. And so that I didn't stop until about a year later, but I've stopped that too as well. And so when things started opening up again, I basically didn't really have a desire to go back to see patients. And part of it was also related to the fact that we didn't have a vaccine. I was like, why would I risk exposing myself and my family if I didn't have to? Mm -hmm. When I could build an awesome business on zoom. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so did you, I'm curious about niching down into like, am, am I right that it's female physicians and money? Yeah, you got it. And so how did you, did you just start right into women and money or did you like do general coaching for women physicians and then narrow into money? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so it was always money related. And it's funny you asked that because when I first started, it was kind of like financial education. Like I was just helping people understand like, what's a 401k, how do you do this? How do you do that? That's kind of how it started. And so, and then I started working with my own coach, a life coach. And then it was clear to me that like the mindset part was like the missing piece, right? Cause you could learn about the stock market, real estate, all you can ad nauseum, mm-hmm. but if you don't think you can do it, it doesn't matter. Right. And so when I started getting coaching with her and I worked with her for general life coaching, and I guess it's all the same, right? Mm-hmm. This it was all mindset stuff. And then I got certified. And so then I, it's still money, but I sort of niche to like coaching on the T line or like on their limiting beliefs more than just telling them what to do, Mm -hmm. but it was always on female physicians, I guess I had a blog. And so the blog was, I had a lot of non-physician readers, you could say, or followers, but in terms of my paid programs, you have to be a female physician. Right. Okay. Okay. Let's go. So tell us if you're willing, what 
um, what did you struggle with money, like around money, your thoughts and beliefs around money? It's funny because you, did you ask, what did I struggle with? Yeah. Okay. Cause I still struggle with a lot of things related to it's money. It's all fixed. You should just pretend it's all it's fixed. All, it's a, like- yeah. I wish I could say it's hundred percent fixed <laughs> and I can lead, lead the way. Um, I mean, I think it was like, if I had to really think about like my biggest struggle, it's like, I don't think I even knew that I could be rich. Mm. Like it wasn't even, yeah, it wasn't even something I was yearning for because I just didn't think it was possible. Like it just didn't even occur. It wasn't on my radar. Mm-hmm. It's even like, like someone else gets, has the money. Like it's out there. Other people have money. Yeah. Like there's rich people and there's me and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not one of those people. Like that's kind of how I grew up. And so it wasn't even something like I always wanted more money. Like I always liked fancy things. Like I remember since I was really young, I wanted really nice things. I really, I liked expensive brands when I was little, even though my parents didn't have a lot of money um, that hasn't changed, <laughs> but how I could, how I could buy them. But I just I remember thinking when I was like a little girl, like we're, we're not one of those rich families. And I just, it just didn't even occur to me. That's something I could, I could become or have one day. Mm-hmm. And so I still struggle with that a little bit. It's just, it's just different now because I, I make a lot more money than I did when I was than before, but it's like, there's always more, I guess, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that it's a like scarcity, like it could be better. There, there can be, there could be more like, it just gave me a quick example, right? Cause I remember like growing up, I never flew on an airplane until like after college. And I remember just being so excited that I could like fly on planes and like travel, but then it just, but then like, it just gets more expensive. You're, you know, as you get more money, you just like upgrade. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when I remember going to like backpacking after medical school and staying in like hostels. And now I stay in much nicer hotels and I fly, I generally fly first class or business when I can. But of course now I'm like, oh, it'd be awesome to fly private. <laughs> you know, that's like. Right. And my goal is like private chef. That's like my ultimate. That's ultimate. not that expensive actually. I bet you could do that now. See, I have not even looked into the price of that. So maybe, okay, that's my homework for later. <laughs> Jenny, did you, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to hear your perspective, Bonnie, because I would imagine as someone who, so I'm a lawyer by trade and I, I think people expect that do- people who are going into practice medicine or practice law actually can think of themselves as having wealth or being rich. And so I like, was that part of the reason that you went into medicine was because of the earning capacity or did you go into your career for a totally different reason? You know, it's funny. Like, I don't think I really knew what people made. Mm -hmm. Like looking, looking back, I'm like, that's really weird. Why wouldn't I know that? Like I knew doctors, I knew doctors weren't poor in terms of what they made, but I didn't really understand what they actually made. And I think even if someone, I'm sure someone told me, but even if they told me, I don't think I really understood what that meant in terms of lifestyle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I think you bring a good, good point because I think people assume if you're a professional, like a lawyer, doctor making, actually, it's interesting. I I, sometimes I wonder what the public thinks we really make because there's, there's a huge range of income. I'm sure for lawyers Mm -hmm. too, right? There's some doctors who barely make over a hundred K. Well, that's pretty uncommon. I would say most doctors make at least 200 K and there's doctors who make over a million dollars. Like that's less common, but there is a range. And maybe the average income is between three and 500, which I know is a lot, but then like when you, when taxes come into play, it's not as much as people think, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right. Cause it could take up a sizable portion of your paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think you kind of hit the nail on the head because even if you are making a good salary, if you don't, if you bring your like poor or broke mindset to it, you, you never feel like you have enough. And I actually tell my clients, like it gets, if you don't clean these up at your current income level, like it just, it just gets worse. It actually gets worse when you have more money. Cause then you're afraid of losing it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can I just, I, I also suspect that most doctors, and maybe this is something that plays out with you and your clients, like most doctors accumulate a significant amount of student loan debt. Right. And so that also, I imagine factors into their relationship to money. Is that something that you work on with your clients? Yeah. So debt's like one of the things I love talking about because basically everyone thinks debt is bad. And because everyone thinks debt is bad, everyone's upset that they have it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And because everyone's upset that they have it, they feel like they have to get rid of it as soon as possible. And I actually kind of preach the opposite 
Mm-hmm. Everyone's obsessed with paying off debt because they think it's going to make them feel better. Mm-hmm. It does temporarily, sure. But then like, that's it. <laughs> when I say that's it, it, it's not like you start getting checks in the mail because you paid off your debt. And so but it's, it is probably the hardest thing for my clients to shift mm-hmm. to see that the debt itself isn't a problem, that it's not the cause of their money stress or worries. Because a lot of people will blame their debt or they, they'll say, oh, I'm bad with money. I have so much debt. And not just student loan debt, because a lot of doctors accumulate uh, consumer debt. You know, Because if you think of a physician who gets married and has kids during training, which, which happens, right? Because not everyone puts off child, childbearing until after residency, because then we're like 30, 35 plus. And so if you think of a resident, especially if you live in New York City, if we don't always have a choice of where we end up training, it's kind of like the military in that sense. So if you're in New York City living on a resident salary and then having to pay for a nanny or childcare, like people can't afford it. And so they go into debt or they take on additional loans. Mm-hmm. And so now I, like when I look at the price of school now, like it's insane. And I don't feel like I graduated that long ago. And I thought my schooling was expensive. The tuition was 40K plus the cost of living in New York City. So maybe it was 65K a year times mm-hmm. four. Now it's like 65K for tuition at some of these private schools. So yeah, it's a little insane. You know, I got to tell you that I love that you're just like, here are the numbers and there's so much um, hidden, like, don't, don't say what you spent. Like, I just appreciate that. You're like, I think doctors make from 200 to a million. And this is what the two, thank you for just saying the numbers. Like I am always that person who's spouting out these things. And everyone's like, did you just ask her how much she made? I'm like, yeah, I did. So thank you for that to open up. I think that's really important to be able to do Bonnie. What are the issues that your clients come to you with besides debt? Well, yeah. I was going to say they talk Dad's a lot number about one. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually the other thing is they just, I think it's not even related to money. It's basically, you know, the concept of the arrival fallacy. They mm-hmm. thought like they'd be happy mm-hmm. once they finished mm-hmm. their training and here I am. Yeah, here I am. And, uh, what, <laughs> this is it because when you're going through training, there's like the next goal, the next goal, the next goal. And then when you finally, we call it, you become an attending and maybe for an academics, there might be some other milestones to hit, like becoming a full professor, et cetera. But for the most, you know, most physicians don't go into academics. And so, and then if you're you know, a woman and you're, you have a family, like they're like, I did everything. I like went to medical school. I finished, I got a great job. I'm married. I have kids. And then they're like, it's not even that they're unhappy. I think they're like, I thought I would be happier and they're not. Then they think something is wrong. And it, so it kind of down spirals from that from that. And then a lot of people then think, oh my God, I'm not happy. And I have all this debt and I can't leave medicine now. Mm -hmm. Or they think they need to leave medicine to be happier because they think they think changing the circumstances will, will, Mm -hmm. will be better. Mm -hmm. And And then they see me because they want to figure out how to make enough money to get out. (laughs) Oh, okay. So that's so interesting. So they're not coming to you initially to say, Hey, I want to make more money or help me negotiate more money. They're coming to you saying, I think I should be happier at where, with what I have and where I am. It's, it's a few different things, but it's, it's a combination of that. A lot of people come to me because they don't feel like they understand money and they have a lot of stress about it and they want to get a handle on it. And then there's some woman, actually one of my current one-on-one clients, uh, she and her husband make a lot of money combined like close to a million dollars, but then they don't, she doesn't feel secure or doesn't feel like they're handling the money well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another point is like having a high income doesn't mean, you know, what you're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there like, I, I love this idea of like, when it comes to money, like in that example, like the capacity to have, like to actually hold on to the money and be okay with just having it in a bank account or choosing to invest in real estate or stocks or equity, whatever. Is that something that you see up, come, come up with your clients? Oh yeah. I don't think anyone knows. I don't think they, any, most people don't understand the, what you just said, the capacity to have, because most people think of money as something you spend as soon as you get it or like, like what, do I, what do I do with up. this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how do you help them? Like, what do you need to point out in terms of the having money or yeah, having money? That's not something, let's see, that, that's actually a lesson in my program, like just like sitting with Brilliant. having the money. Mm-hmm. But I think like, I actually have this uh, 
lesson where we talk about the different types of relations we have money and a lot of them identify with multiple, but one of them is called the hot potato. And that's just kind of what it reminds like, as soon as you get the money, you just like spend yeah. the money, you know, yeah. you like, and so a lot of women find themselves like buying really nice things because also you have to remember that we waited a long time to make this money. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause like the medical training can be over a decade, right. Depending on where you start starting from college, it's more than a decade, right. Cause four years of college, four years of med school residency, we can do anywhere between three and 10 years additional, although the average is probably five years. So they're just like, I deserve this. And so mm -hmm. I see a lot of people just spending kind of, I don't want to say crazy, but just haphazardly mm -hmm. because they just deprive themselves so long of having nice things or just having the things they think they should have. And especially when they're comparing themselves to their peers who didn't become doctors and just got a job right after college and are having the life, like, you know, already have the house, already have the nice cars and have all those things. So there is an aspect of keeping up with the Joneses and also society's like, everyone thinks we're all rich mm -hmm. and that if, and then people, and it's like, if you drive a car, that's not quote unquote, a doctor car, like pe people get asked questions. Mm. Like, shouldn't you upgrade that car? Isn't it time to move into a doctor house? Mm. There's a lot of that, like kind of dichotomy of like expectations of society. And even like parents, like one of my girlfriends, her, and her they're both doctors and they do make a very, a very good living. Um, but they're, but they're modest, like their money, like having nice flashy things is, isn't like their thing. And her mom kept saying like, when are you going to upgrade? This is a starter house. Wow. Huh. Bonnie, I'm curious, you work with women physicians and I'm curious just from being a physician yourself and spending all of this time in medical school and you know, working in, in hospitals, I presume you're around male physicians as well. Do you, is your perception that men like male physicians handle money differently than the women, you know, I haven't worked with men specifically, but I've spoken to a lot and they don't understand money either because it's like, you don't learn this stuff, but yeah. there's this social sort of expectation that the men handle the money. So, I mean, I guess no, because like even working with my clients, like, and I, a lot of them are married to physicians. Not a lot of the times, like the, the women are actually handling the money. I, mm -hmm. I see, I see both ways, but basically we're equally clueless. I think is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's a good point that women often do the budgeting within a household or the grocery shopping or whatever. And they do, they are often responsible for the money, but they never get the credit or they don't give themselves the credit to trust themselves with money or see themselves as good with money. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I think what I've been thinking a lot about, and I'd love your thoughts on this is that what I just said is like the ability to trust myself with money and like, can you have money and know that you are going to spend it? Like you said on, you know, maybe seemingly frivolous things like purse or shoes, or like, so you play the image, like, can I trust myself to make the decisions on how I spend the money? And I think there's two like ways to do that. Like one is out of like panic and I got to look this certain way. And there's another, I'm going to buy this, um, uh, whatever designer purse, because I love myself and I respect myself and I want to treat myself and I do it out of love versus out of like, I got to look this way. I got to, you know, out of scarcity. Yeah. And the other way scarcity looks is they buy it because to feel better. Right. Uh, Cause yeah, like, Oh, I'll change. feel better if I have this mm -hmm. thing. So it's, I like what you said, like the ability to trust yourself. Cause that's, I mean, I, I feel like that's kind of what money boils down or like really anything mm -hmm. in life, right. Even losing weight is like really trusting yourself, having your own back, not being, not beating yourself up when you quote unquote, make a mistake. Cause mm -hmm. you know, all type a professional women were like exceedingly hard on ourselves. I think women physicians are particularly hard. Like, I don't think we even notice how mean we are to ourselves because it's become like the noise, like the background of how we speak, like how we speak to ourselves. It's so normal. We don't even notice like how mean it is. And that's something I've had to get coached on a lot because it didn't even sound like I wasn't specifically saying like, you suck. How, why are you so stupid? But I was saying basically the same thing, but like in nicer words, <laughs> I don't remember exactly like what I was saying. 
but it took a while to kind of like unravel that because it just, it wasn't even in my awareness that that wasn't a nice thing to tell myself, but that is something I really teach my clients is to, to like trust themselves. And that I think that really comes down to self-love Yeah, and like loving yourself and no worth. matter. Yeah. And knowing, having your own back, like it's like, I was going to say, pick yourself up, but like, we're so afraid of making a mistake, mm-hmm. you know, like type A professional women, especially physician. I think everyone, right. But I think physicians like, like you can make a mistake, you can harm someone. And so, mm-hmm. and when you are a physician, that means you did really well in school and probably got lots of A's. You probably didn't get anything below a B. And so our relationship to failure is like basically super messed up. I mean, that, mm-hmm. I think school teaches that, but that's a whole other discussion. And so like the idea that you're going to have to fail to become wealthy. Mm-hmm. It's not something a lot of my clients mm-hmm. love hearing. I guess it's the best way to say it. It's mm-hmm. very uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a question for you, Bonnie, just related to being a yeah. doctor during the pandemic. Have you noticed a shift in your client? Like, like what has happened since the pandemic started? Cause I can't imagine the kind of pressure that someone in your profession has, yeah. has felt like I, if I can imagine what I would have you know, felt if I were in Mm -hmm. those shoes. And so what kind of changes have you seen or what, what kind of observations have you seen in your clientele or in your community since COVID hit? Doctors were already getting really burned out before COVID for a number Mm -hmm. of reasons that I, I mean, you probably can guess some of them. It's just like the way we're paid and, you know, now you can review your doctor on Yelp, but we can't respond because of HIPAA. It's like Mm. just a lot of things. Like, and so a lot of a growing amount of doctors have been unhappy with the profession and, um, yeah. because they just, we want to just see patients and treat them. We don't want to deal with, but they make us do all this other stuff to even, you know, like, right. Like use the electronic medical system and then like fighting with insurances, like all the time to get things covered for our patients. And I think a lot of doctors are like, that's not why I didn't become a doctor to be a paper pusher or be on the phone, argue, you know, having somebody yeah. who's not a doctor tell me what's best for my patient. And so that already was coming to an untenable level. And then you throw in COVID no matter what specialty, like every specialty has been affected. And I think there, are, this is just, you know, it's sort of my opinion, right? Cause I don't really know the data, but definitely the mental distress of physicians is like skyrocketed, like suicide. I mean, suicide was always a problem. There's been more suicide since the pandemic. There's been people who actively are trying to leave medicine, which is mm-hmm. scary because who's going to be left to treat us. And it just, the, yeah, the mental health has just been suffering so much and it's just, it's just been getting worse. That's so unfortunate because obviously we all need you, <laughs> you know, we all need your, your, your profession to be stable and present and healthy. And, you know, as a community, we, we need that. And so I, I asked that question because I, since the pandemic started, I watch a lot of doctors on YouTube, because so many people I feel like have come onto social media and come onto YouTube to try to share information for patients. Um, and it's, it's not a profession. I mean, like I said, I'm a lawyer. I don't have a lot of relationships to physicians. It's been really eye opening to sort of see these people sharing their experiences and trying to help and, and running into the kinds of issues that you're talking about where, you know, they're not really able to help people the way that they they thought they would, when they were going into the practice of medicine, because of all of these issues around insurance and red tape and like fear of lawsuits and all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. Fear of lawsuits is definitely here. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with, you know, I think a lot of doctors feel betrayed by the public really with the pandemic. Yeah. So tell, tell us more about that. Well, that kind of goes into vaccine talk, but basically They don't take, they don't believe the doc, what the doctor just say. There's a lot of people who just won't, you know, won't take, I'm trying to think it's, it's not even like won't take medical advice because they say they won't do this, but then like they're the first, those people are the same people who go to a doctor and demand antibiotics for a non-bacterial infection. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then these patients also threaten bad reviews. Like it's, that's kind of what medicine is. It's some doctors feel like they're like a Burger King now, like people are coming with their orders. And if you don't give them what they want, they'll like, they threaten a bad review. And so that does happen. Mm -hmm. And then I think with the vaccine, because it's like, they're telling, we know what's going to help. 
and some people refuse to do it. I'm not talking about the people who can't do it or whatever. Um, and then mm-hmm. they get sick and they're still going to treat you. Mm-hmm. You know, they're still going to treat you even if you didn't get vaccinated because you believed the stuff that's not true. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, I think they're, they're tired from the pandemic love last year. And now it's like on the, you know, we're recording this in August. And so there's sort of a new blip coming out, you know, the Delta, the Delta uh, variant rather. So I think we're just, just, they're just tired. I have a really kind of, maybe it's a dumb question. I just don't know how the practice of medicine works, but I, it seems like the doctors in the ERs and in the ICUs are, are really burnt out. And like, I've just seen so many stories where people haven't taken a day off in 500 days and just horrifying situations. Is it, is it possible that, um, physicians who have other specialties can go and fill in, in those cases, if there aren't enough doctors, like I see you doctors or ER doctors. So not, is, not easily, not really. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't, I'm a dermatologist. Now I'd be pretty useless in the emergency uh-huh. room. Yeah. Like, I mean, I wouldn't be completely useless, but I wouldn't be able to really be in a physician capacity. I guess I could be a nurse or something. I don't know. Yeah. Like I'm better than the average person, I guess. <laughs> it's just like one of those things I've wondered. Cause like if mm-hmm. this thing doesn't go away, right. Like what happened? Like you're but, saying well, it's not, it's yeah. Okay. I know that's not what we're talking about on the show, but like <laughs> Viruses just don't go away. I mean, yeah. except for like, well, we have eradicated certain viruses like smallpox. Mm-hmm. We did eradicate measles temporarily, but then, you know, we, we all mm-hmm. know what happened. So I think it's just, uh, right now my, per- this is just my personal opinion is like, it's just, gonna be, it's going to be like the flu. Mm-hmm. We'll get better treatments. Like we have better treatments now that we did a year ago and just like, the flu has different strains. Like I've gotten the flu even on the vaccine, but then people will say, then why get it if you can still get it? But it's, but I also understand, like I ha- I do have, I'm not sure of the word of sympathy, but I understand what it's like to not be a doctor. Like it's, it's hard to understand these things. And so like, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's like their fault either. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this is like complicated things to understand and the messaging hasn't been, centralized in my opinion. And so it's hard. I, w- I would see like, as a, as a mom, if you have kids, it's like, it's really hard to know who to listen to. And I totally yeah. get that. Yeah, I agree. I think public health is a really hard profession too. <laughs> yeah, and totally. Yeah. Oh, and the okay. last thing I want to say about doctors mm-hmm. and, uh, is, and this kind of maybe ties things back is like, we, we don't pro- like, we don't prioritize self-care like this is men and female physicians. And we're kind of held to this weird standard by society and our employers. Like we're human beings too, but like, I feel like the public doesn't realize that sometimes or nor our employers and that we need time off. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Jenny. All right. Let's go back to your book. And you have a book coming out shortly. You want to tell us about it? Yeah. So the book is called, Defining Wealth for Women, Peace, Purpose, and Plenty of Cash. And well, it's a book about money, obviously, for women. But what's different, and I obviously haven't read every money book on the planet, but I think what's different about mine is I really give people the history of women and money. Mm-hmm. And that's something, you know, Sandy and I learned in our, mm-hmm. we, we did this feminist coaching. Uh, I call us, I call it like a fellowship, like a coaching mm-hmm. fellowship, yeah, kind of like, like you do fellowships mm-hmm. and trading. Yeah. So we did a fellowship in like feminist mindset coaching. And so I give people the history of women, women, cause I think it's a, it's fascinating. It's super fascinating. And I think it, I don't know. I just feel like when a woman reads that they're like, oh, no wonder I feel not this way fault. about money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not my fault. Exactly. And a little bit of the socialization that really prevents us from going after what we want. And then I also explain sort of the brain science, like the cognitive reasons why it's hard for us to become wealthy. Like literally it's not, it's not an accident. So like you bring all these things together and then you have this perfect storm of women who are not confident. And also like, you're kind of going against like our, our, the way, the way our brain is wired, like our brain is like wired to pay off debt basically. And our brain is not wired to want to buy buy and grow assets, which is what you need to do to create wealth. Right. And is the, are you referring to the motivational triad there? I am. Yeah. I am referring to the motivational triad. Yeah. And I do teach some, you know, ways to 
you can't undo the Mavitri, but you can redirect your brain basically. Right. Yeah. Let's just, do you want to explain the motivational, uh, triad just so everyone yeah. on the same page? Yeah. So like, I mean, this is just such a great thing to talk about. So, you know, our, our brain is basically wants to just live. It wants to survive. That's its primary like directive is to keep us alive. And so it's a pretty, <laughs> it sounds, it sounds obviously fabulous, but then it has a pretty low bar, meaning that if you're alive right now, that's then it basically thinks, why would you change anything? And so mm-hmm. it's, that's why it's so hard to make change because our brains are just, they love the status quo. And so the motivational try to kind of explains the three things that kind of help your brain sort of focus on the survival directive. So the first one is it wants to avoid pain. And I'm, I'm mostly talking about emotional pain, but certainly physical pain. That's why it's hard to push ourselves and working out. Right. Uh, the second one is it seeks pleasure. And so it makes sense. Like there has to be some pleasure involved in sort of survival things like eating food and having sex. So you could procreate and keep the human species alive. Right. And then the third thing is since your brain wants to survive, it wants to conserve energy. And so I call it E. Some people call it efficiency. Basically it doesn't want to do anything. It doesn't have to. It's basically lazy is how I explain it. Mm -hmm. And so paying off debt actually hits all three points because it's easy. Meaning like you don't have to learn anything new to pay off debt. You already know how to pay a bill. Hopefully you do. Right. (laughs) And to pay debt faster, you just have to put more money. Like you just have to like pay them more money every month, but you don't have to, it's, it's not like some new skill you have to, you don't have to buy the book, how to, how to like actually make the debt payment. Yeah. There's nothing. That's the first thing. Yeah. The second thing is the avoid pain and the pleasure thing are kind of tied together because society, like everyone thinks debt is bad. And so debt creates emotional pain because we think that. And so by paying off debt, you like, you're decreasing that emotional pain that you think debt is causing. And the pleasure part is because you're a decreasing that emotional pain and B when you see that number decrease, like that's a form of pleasure in terms of like progress, like, Oh, kind of like when you lose weight and you're like, Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, I weigh five pounds. Like, yeah. little yeah. dopamine hit when you see that number decrease. Mm-hmm. And plus everyone's telling you like Dave Ramsey, like get rid of it. You should pay it off. Everyone's. And here's another thing I think is interesting. Like people celebrate being debt-free. Mm-hmm. Like that's the one thing about money. People are public about sometimes right, like pay, at least right. among doctors, like people will announce I'm debt-free. Mm -hmm. people rarely announce, well, maybe not in our circle since we're entrepreneurs, but in non-entrepreneur circles, people don't usually talk about I'm a millionaire or now I have a million dollars net worth. Like, but to me, that's way more exciting than being debt free. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And how do you, um, if you, can you apply the emotional or the motivational triad to, if, if, if there's a woman entrepreneur who wants to make more money, this is, Mm -hmm. this is our life. Jenny's in it my life. This is the people that we deal with. So they're like, I'm going to build a business. This is going to be fantastic. It's going to be great. I'm going to make so much money. And then they hit the reality of like, Oh, I've got to do all this work and do all these things that are uncomfortable. Do you, can you just sort of use the motivational triad to apply it to wanting more? To wanting more money, wanting more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what you just said, like that I have to do all this work. And so like, that sort of goes against the whole brain's efficiency thing, right? Because the brain's like, this isn't a good idea starting the business. Like we're alive. Like this is not guaranteed to work. We might die. Like that's, that's how simplistic our brains are. And so, but you know, entrepreneurs type a women were, were generally motivated to want to do hard things. So that's something you can kind of like over, like, you know, your audience and my audience, like we're, we've, we've had a lot of practice in overriding that efficiency thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of discomfort in growing a business, right. A lot of failure, a lot of discomfort, like not getting what you want. And so that's the, that's the avoid pain thing. Like it's, I, I, I mean, that's, I'm curious what you guys think, but my, I would say, cause I, I'm not a business coach, but I love learning about business and I have a business coach myself. And so most people quit. Mm-hmm. before they're oh, successful. Yeah. yeah. Or even when they're successful, they quit. Yeah. They still can't, even if you're successful, doesn't mean that you're happy. Right. Cause mm-hmm. there's just so much. So that's, I mean, I've tried to, I've wanted to quit so many times in my business for sure. And so I think like you have that, you have to really increase your ability to allow discomfort mm-hmm. and to be okay with not getting what you want. And that can be really hard if you're kind of a type a person, which successful person, mm-hmm. what I mean by that is you're generally getting, you're, you're sort of used to always succeeding. 
<laughs> doesn't necessarily work like that in business. Right. Right. And then the pleasure thing, it's usually delayed because it, it's not like you open the business and then you're suddenly a millionaire, right? It takes time and work. Right. And so it's delayed. And so that's why, you know, you can't just do it solely for the money. Mm -hmm. I think you can, money can definitely, but like, if that's the only reason you're building a business, like you're just going to, you're going to quit. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. The money is totally fun, but like you need a bigger why to carry you through those times when you're not succeeding. At least I think so. What about and generally, generally speaking, there are more lucrative, more proven strategies for accumulating wealth than starting a business or being an entrepreneur, right? Like the likelihood that you're going to hit it out of the park with your business is so low that if you were actually thinking logically about it and you just wanted to be wealthy to me, it's like, oh, like go manage a hedge fund. Like it's so like go work on wall street, like, or go be a doctor, go be a partner in a law firm. Like there's so many more sure proven ways to accumulate a high paycheck than to be an entrepreneur that you like, you have to have some other reason because it's, and if you think that that's the way, the best way to make money from like a calculated logical standpoint, then I don't know what to say. Cause I don't think, <laughs> I don't think anyone really evaluating it would, would think that. I think it'd be really interesting to see what the, the data shows like, cause, um, just cause I, I know, I know the statistics on business, like most businesses fail after you guys probably know this data more than I do, but like mm -hmm. even becoming a doctor, like this, when I apply the acceptance rate to my medical school is less than 5%. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the, what are the stats on business? Don't the majority like, of them like fail after three years? Any? Yeah. It's like within two years, I think 98% of businesses yeah. fail. Probably so, because they quit though. Right. Well, I mean, I think people, people quit if they can't get it off the ground. So I don't know how you you know, partition those things apart from each other. Yeah. So I, it like some people only have so much runway, I think, to work with in some cases. And so then it's kind yeah. of quitting, but it's also just, they need to pay their bills. Yeah. So, it's so yeah. funny because to me, I think you can make so much more money as an entrepreneur than mm. being a doctor or a lawyer. Like I think doc, so my clients are, they often feel not even timid, but, um, they don't like sharing how much money they make to non-physicians because of that, because society thinks we're rich. But now that I'm an entrepreneur and I have a lot of entrepreneur friends, I'm like, Oh, doctors don't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs there's, make there's no a lot more money. Yeah. There's no ceiling. I think that's to me, that's what mm -hmm. is different. There's no ceiling mm -hmm. in business mm -hmm. versus there is a ceiling in all those professions you named more or less. I mean, there's a high ceiling for physicians though. Like you can mm -hmm. make Mm -hmm. but it's not scalable if you're a traditional yeah. doctor. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is so many entrepreneurs won't make any money really versus like, if you go into these other professions, you're still going to be able to make a living versus entrepreneurs. Like you have to really want it, I think, to be successful. And, and yeah, I think it's also harder for women to be successful for lots of reasons outside of our control. So I think you have to really want to do it and you have to be willing to, to stay in it long enough to get over all of those challenges. Yeah. Someone was telling me that the number of female entrepreneurs who make over even just $1 million, $1 million. it's like, it's, it's like super low. It's like less than 1%. Is that true? It's, so, it's something it's less than 2%. It's, yeah, it's it like, true. it's a tiny, it's a tiny percentage that make over a hundred thousand. And then the percentage that makes over a million is really, really, really tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of female founded companies. It's not just their size. It's not when you say women entrepreneurs, it's actually like female founded companies. Almost none of those companies make more than a million dollars. So it. it's really, really unusual. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of reasons, as you said, Jenny, like as to why it's so hard for women to create businesses and really scale it to a million plus. One of the reasons, and I'd love Bonnie's opinion on this is I think women have so many beliefs about what money does to them, what it means if they have money. Um, and I've been sort of exploring this idea of like, what if we believe, what if we wanted the million dollar business or million dollar salary, whatever, what if we wanted a lot of things and we knew that it didn't change us? Like, I think there's so much around what people think will happen when they have those high ticket sales or that big revenue or however the wealth may you come. I mean, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you saying that women are worried about 
themselves or what? Because mm-hmm. I think they're more worried about what other people what think people of them. What people think, yeah. Yeah, I think they're more worried about what other people think of them. Mm-hmm. Um, like, because I because we don't talk about money, so it's not something you can celebrate, right? No. So like, you know, when I make seven figures, which I plan to the next year, like it's not something I'll probably put on my public face. Well, I'll put it on my business, my business profile, but I probably wouldn't put it on my personal Facebook profile, mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. which is interesting, right? Maybe and what's the fear that. there? With, and what's the judgment that you're worried about? The judgment is, because this is actually something I still struggle with is, um, I'm trying to think how to say it. Yeah. That I made money in some shady way. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I have the same, I have the exact same thing. I did not have that one. Yeah. Yeah, That's so interesting. And I think as a money coach, it's like, even Mm. I justify that belief, right? Like, well, yeah. I'm making money by helping people with money. Like that sounds weird. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But that's, that's just, those are just my thoughts, obviously. Right. But. Yeah. I just wanted to pull up the statistic so that we're accurate here in the, in the show. And it's 88% of women owned businesses generate less than a hundred thousand annually. Wow. And of all women led companies, there are only 4.2% that generate more than 1 million in annual revenue. So it's, I mean, those, I think those numbers are pretty staggering. It's why money coaching and business coaching, I I think are so incredibly important, right? 88% of women-owned companies, like the companies make less than a hundred thousand. So let alone what those salaries are for those founders. You know, what's so interesting. I think just the circles iron in, it seems like everyone makes a lot of money. Like there it's, it's, it's normalized if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's fun to be around women who are making a lot of money, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's interesting. And I hope that you put, if you do, when you do not, if, when you make your million that you do publicize that, because I think this, like, we just, nobody knows, nobody has a clue. So I'm super excited that you're close to that, close to that milestone. Me too. Yeah. All right. Jenny, do you want to join hustle? Let's do it. Okay, Bonnie. So at the end of every episode, we ask our guest to share a joy. So something that's bringing you joy in your life right now and a tool that can help our listeners hustle in their career or business. God, it's hard to pick just one, <laughs> right? The joy, cause there's like so many, but this is, it's right in front of me. So I'll, I'll say, and plus this is going to be on video, this water bottle. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Look at it's, that. I don't know if you could see it, but it's, yeah. it's pink and sparkly with like crystals. I don't know if they're Swarovski crystals, but they're crystals. Uh, this was a $100 water bottle, which like <laughs> when I first, when I bought it, I was like, that's a really silly thing to buy, but I love it. Plus it actually makes me drink enough water every day because mm-hmm. I know I need to drink four of these a day. And there's just something about it. Plus everyone loves it when they see it. So it brings wow. me joy and it, and it brings like other people joy. Cause when I travel, I'll, I'll have it with me. That is um, the best joy we've had in a long time. Wait, we need oh, to know really? the brand. It's, the brand. Yeah, who it's called, it? to- it's called, uh, Tomo T O M O. Okay. I saw, um, do you guys know who Corinne Crabtree is? Yeah. Yeah. She's Mm -hmm. a life coach. Yeah. I saw her have it on her Instagram feed and I was like, I need that. (laughs) (laughs) This pink and sparkles are sort of my thing. Rose gold. So that's the joy piece. And then the hustle. And so remind me again, this is a tip for your. A tool, a book, a resource, something that can help our listeners hustle in their career or business. Yeah. Well, of course I'm going to mention my book, defining wealth for women, because it's going to just help. And it, whether you're in business or for personal, it's just going to help you understand why it's been so hard to even want more money and to go after it and sort of like understanding that you have to go against, I mean, thousands of hundreds of thousands of like brain evolution that hasn't evolved to our current modern era. And so I think understanding that and then learning the tools to kind of like bypass those, I call them brain glitches, like it's just going to be helpful. Cause if you're an entrepreneur, you have to figure out money, right? Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. by definition, mm-hmm. you're an entrepreneur makes money. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you're not okay with that, or if there's something uncomfortable or you're worried about judgment, it's just, that's when you quit. So I think this work is super important. Um, and just to be clear, I think you said it, but I just want to emphasize, it's not just for female physicians. That book is for any woman who wants to have more money in their life. You got it. Awesome. All right, Bonnie, thank you so much. Where can people find you if they want to follow what you're doing? Sure. My 
brand is called Wealthy Mom MD. And so everything is named that the website, Instagram, Wealthy Mom MD. And then the, even the book they can find on my website as well. And when does that come out? October? I don't have a firm date yet, but sometime in October. October 2021. Okay. We will be sure yeah. to look for it and help you promote it in any way we can. Thank you, Bonnie. It has been super fun and such a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you so much.